show. I'm glad you're here tonight. And I'm glad that Brother Elvin's going to lead our singing tonight. I know y'all got tired of looking at me this morning. And I sort of got tired of looking at y'all too. So, it, uh, you know, Brother Elvin's going to lead us. And we're going to have a good time. I don't think I'm going to re uh, repeat all these announcements. The only thing I'm going to mention is the Valentine's Banquet. If you have not yet signed up, please do so. We have a children's menu. Uh, and it's uh, $10, and all the proceeds go to the youth uh, mission trip. That is Saturday, uh, February 13th. And I appreciate it uh, in advance. What about prayer concerns? I, I meant to mention to you this morning, Mr. Souther spent a Thursday night in the hospital in Memphis, had some fluid on his lungs, but he got out and doing great, obviously. Uh, so we're grateful for that. Do you know of anybody else from the church who's in the hospital or had a, a loss or anything like that? What about anybody particularly close to you that we need to mention? Anybody from the community? I had a cousin pass away with brain cancer. Oh, no. How old was he? How old was he? Uh -huh. Early people's. My goodness. What was his name? Uh, Tim Langley. Tim Langley? He's in our Oh, oh, okay, okay. Yes, yeah, okay. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah, I see. I see. Uh, I see. Sorry. Does he own a car dealership? No. There's a Tim Langley yeah. Ford. Uh, I thought maybe that's something. They may be in down the line somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, yeah, I know Tim Langley Ford. So. Anybody else? What about answer prayer? God doing anything in anybody's life. Amen. 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 Anybody been blessed? I tell you, if, if you want to know whether you've been blessed, I'll take two fingers here, put them right here, and praise. Y'all feel anything? It means you've been blessed. <laughs> All right, let's pray together, and uh, maestros will come lead us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity of worshiping together again tonight. And Lord, what uh, you have to say through, it, through me tonight is extremely important. And I think it hits us right between the eyes. Because I know that there are times I'm guilty of what I'm preaching of. And you know, Lord, that I could just have had to hit my face this afternoon and repent before I could in good conscience stand up and preach on this subject tonight. And I pray that your spirit would move. Lord, I don't want to let a guilt trip on anybody. That's not my job. If anybody gets convicted, it ought not be because of me. It ought to be because of your spirit. But if there are those of us here who just have a, an inordinate love of the world, I pray that we repent of that and that as our love for the world diminishes, that our love for you would increase. In Jesus' name, amen. Aren't you glad to see Jane back in her rightful spot? Thank you. I'm glad God healed you. Thank you for being patient. It is a blessing to have Jane back at the piano. If she was not able, I guess Brother Greg would have had to play tonight. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to begin with Down at the Cross. We're going to do the first, second, and the last verses. <laughs>
and stand up, stand up for Jesus. <laughs> He died 
on January 28, 814, and he was buried in this magnificent cathedral in France. Well, over time, that cathedral crumbled and fell into ruins, and the long and the short of it is they, they lost his burial place. They knew the details of his burial. He was buried sitting on a specially constructed throne, a throne made of solid oak. He was lashed to that throne. Obviously, a dead body couldn't stay there on its own, so they lashed him to that throne with leather straps. They placed a solid gold crown on his head. They put this jewel-encrusted cape around his shoulders, over 600 diamonds sewn into that, and they placed a Latin Bible in his lap. Now, he was the leader of the church, although he really had no use for spiritual matters at all. Uh, he was just kind of carrying out his duty. So he was seated on a throne, wearing a crown, a jewel-encrusted cape, and had a Latin Bible in his lap. Well, as I said, they lost the cathedral and eventually lost the place that Charlemagne was buried. Finally, they stumbled upon it in World War II, and they started to unearth it, not realizing what they had, but they eventually, by the inscriptions, determined it was the burial place of Charlemagne. Now, when they dug down into that burial chamber, they saw that the throne was still intact. But seated on that throne was a grinning skeleton, still lashed to the throne, but nothing more than a skeleton. The crown had fallen off of his head and was now sitting there on the dirt floor. That jewel-encrusted cape had become moth-eaten, obviously, had disintegrated, and there were nothing but a handful of diamonds on the floor. That Bible was still open, and a bony finger was still pointing to that Bible. Do you know the verse that that finger was pointing to? It wasn't the original verse that, was, that it was pointing to when he was buried. But over the years of time, Something changed, and when they unearthed that skeleton, that bony finger was pointed to Mark 8, 36. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Charlemagne's wealth is impossible to calculate. Most people believe he's the wealthiest man who ever lived worth billions and billions in today's dollars. The most powerful man in history. How would you like to be the king of the world? He had four wives and, four, and five mistresses, had an assortment of legitimate and illegitimate children, 18 of them, and now it is estimated that one-fourth of Europe is directly descended from King Charlemagne. He rivaled Solomon in his wealth and glory and influence, but he loved the world. He just couldn't get enough. He had everything the world had to offer, and that wasn't enough. He went all, on all of these conquests and kept accumulating and accumulating and accumulating, but it brought him nothing but misery, and he died of pleurisy at the age of 43. That's what John warns about in verse 15. Do not love the world. Now, the word world, to what is Jesus referring there? Is he talking about the physical world? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There was a group, and they were very active about the time John wrote, they were called the Gnostics. They believed that anything you could see or touch was evil. The world was evil. Only God was good. And, and they would go through life and wouldn't bathe for decades on end. And, and they would wear this the most uncomfortable clothing. 
They thought that luxuries like new clothing and razors and things like that, that was all foolishness and sinful. They really took it literally later on when Jesus said don't love the world. But is he talking about the physical world? You go back in the story of, of creation, Genesis 1 and 2, every time God created something, remember what it said? And God saw that it was good. We live in a good and beautiful planet. And I think we have an obligation to take care of it. Now, it serves us. We don't serve it. And there are people who've made a religion out of worshiping the earth. You know, we ought not do that. But I do believe in, you know, taking care of the planet that God's placed us on. It, it's good. So John here is not talking about the physical world. He's talking about human society living apart from God. You know what the world means. We, you've all heard sermons, people living out in the world. Well, all of us live in the world if you're talking physically. You know the meaning of that statement. It's people who live their lives apart from God. And there are ten references to that in the book. Uh, beware and show caution to what the world has to offer. And John's readers knew exactly what he meant, it, and we do as well. You know, Jesus says in John 15, 18, if the world hates you, take comfort, it hated me first. Paul says in Ephesians 6, we don't wrestle against uh, earthly foes, but against powers and principalities and demons of the air. There is a system out there and we wage war against it all of the time. Paul says my members wage war against each other. You've got worldly members and you've got godly sanctified members and they are constantly at odds. Do you know anybody like this? If you don't, I could start naming names. I was visiting a fellow one time. Uh, I was doing a revival and went to visit this man who was just a multi-millionaire, probably far seven or 8,000 acres, had a couple of cotton gins. And we went out riding around in uh, one of his <laughs> air-conditioned tractors, had a CD player, and we were riding around, and he, he made the statement, you know, looking around, th things like this, this is what makes it so hard to die. You know, I couldn't help but think of what Paul writes in Colossians, for me to live is, to, uh, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Don't fall so much in love with the world that you just try to put off and put off and put off the eventual appointment you have with death. So John establishes a principle. Do not love the world. And then he gives us some reasons. Why are we not to love the world? Reason number one, he says, do not love the world because of who believers are. Who are you in Jesus Christ? He answers that in verse 15. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in. As a believer, as a child of the Lord Jesus Christ, you possess the love of Almighty God. You've got the love of God, you've got the love of the world, and they are constantly struggling against each other. John talks about this frequently in the book. Look at chapter 3 and verse 14. We know that we pass from life, uh, from death into life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Look at verse 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Down to chapter 4 and verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Here it is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. And sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. In other words, a sacrifice given to appease the wrath of an angry God. Verse 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. 
No man has seen, has seen God at any time. We love one another. God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Look at verse 16. And we've known and believe that love of God, that uh, the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwell, dwell, dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Verse 18, there's no fear in love, but first perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. And on and on and on. There are other verses I can read about us possessing and demonstrating and reflecting the love of God that has been demonstrated for us. And like I said, God so loved the world. That's all of us. God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now that doesn't make us immune from the problems of the world. You possess the word, the love of God. It just makes a big bullseye on your back. You become a bigger target for Satan. Somebody who's really not doing much for the glory of God is not a threat. But if you're actively seeking to glorify him in everything you think, say, and do, you are a target. And he's going to uh, attack you. And, and he's going to try to ease you into this allurement of the world. Do you remember the old hymn, Oh, how the world to evil allures me? Remember that old hymn? used to sing it as a child. You know, the world has allurements. Now you fly over Las Vegas at night. Man, it's, it's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen in your life. You go to Times Square in New York City, it's magnificent. You know, the world has all of these allurements and attractions, but remember what Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. There are certain things in life that are just incompatible. A cigarette lighter and a gas stove are incompatible, aren't they? <laughs> a cigarette lighter and an oxygen tent are incompatible. A bottle of moonshine and a steering wheel is incompatible, isn't it? You know, a, a $50 hair, hairstyle at a fancy French uh, salon and a ball cap, those are incompatible. Certain things in life that are just incompatible. Loving the world and loving God at the same time, those are absolutely incompatible. I don't mean God doesn't want us to have nice things. I don't want you to feel guilty if you buy a new car. Don't feel guilty if you buy a new suit or you know, buy your wife a nice appliance for Christmas. Nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with um, you having things. The problem is when those things have you. When you are so possessed by them and wrapped up in them that you just can't see straight spiritually. So we don't love the world because of who believers are. Number two, we don't love the world because of what it brings out in us. Loving the world it is not just something you do and it doesn't affect you at all. It brings out the worst in you. There are qualities that you exhibit every single day if you're in love with the world. In verse 16, he gives us a list of what the loving the world brings out in us. First of all, the lust of the flesh. That is a word that means a self-seeking attitude. You always want to be first. Remember, Paul talks about one of the men in the church who always had to have the preeminence. You know people like that, they always got to uh, rise head and shoulders above the rest. They've always got to be seen. They've always got to express their opinion. You see something, uh, another meaning of this word is you see something and you scheme to make it yours. An example of this is David Bathsheba. David saw her, was attracted to her, and the rest is history. The lust of the flesh. Listen to what Paul says, or you can turn if you want to, Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, you uh, probably have read this and heard sermons on it. Galatians 5, beginning to read in verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not follow the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, 
In other words, fights against the spirit, incompatible, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other. So that you cannot do the things that you would, but if you be led of the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, which means no shame at all. If you don't know, know what I'm talking about, watch uh, you know, some of these talk shows, Tamara, Queen, Levitra, and people like that. People get on there and they brag about things they ought to be blushing about. That's what lasciviousness means. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, which means idolatry, wrath, strife, sedition, means stirring up a riot, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such, such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. That is what happens to people who are led by uh, the, the lust of the flesh. Ephesians 2 and verse 3. Remember what I told you about how to keep those books uh, separate? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Can you remember General Electric Power Company, G-E-P-C? That's how you keep those uh, books organized. Ephesians 2, verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. 1 Peter 2 uh, just right before you get to 1 John, 1 Peter 2 and verse 11. It says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul. So we avoid it because of what the world brings out in us. It brings out the lust of the flesh following the ways of the world inevitably results in the sins that Paul enumerates for us. But he also says that if we follow the world, it brings out the lust of the eyes. Jesus talks about this in the Sermon on the Mount. Turn back if you want to to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, the middle chapter in the Sermon on the Mount. Verses 22, 23, and 24. Matthew 6, beginning to read in verse 22. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man shall serve two masters, for either, either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is just another word that means the things of the world. Avoid things like, like that. You know, a lot of people think the phrase, the eyes are the window to the soul. You've, you've heard that phrase. A lot of people think that's from the Bible. Actually, that's from Shakespeare, King Lear, but, but I think it's biblical. You know, what you see, uh, you know, settles in your subconscious. Do you know everything you have ever seen finds its place in your subconscious? You know, billions, trillions of thoughts and, and images. And, you know, that's why I'm so opposed to uh, pornography and violence and things like that because it becomes part of your mind. It can never, ever go away. When you surrender your mind to Jesus, he forgives it and he sanctifies it, but he doesn't erase what's there. And certain things can, can bring up things that are already there. You know, the Tenth Commandment, thou shalt not covet. 
Covet means you look at something, you want it, and you scheme to have it. It's this inordinate desire to have something that doesn't belong to you. Yeah, in the Garden of Eden, Satan used this approach. He said, you eat of this fruit, your eyes will be open. You'll become like God. In other words, he was saying, God doesn't want the competition. Uh, God knows that you'll be just like him, and that's why he didn't want you to eat of this fruit. In the, the uh, temptation, when Jesus and Satan met there on the mountain, Satan used this approach, took him up to the pinnacle of the temple, and, and, and said, you know, throw yourself up, off, make yourself a spectacle in front of the people. Then he took him to a mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. He said, look at this. All of this can be yours if you'll just follow me. In Revelation 17, there's this harlot of Babylon, and she's, she's dressed, and she's a, her entire intent is to lead people astray. People who are in battle for the glory of God, and they see her, and hopefully she will sidetrack them. All of that is, is an example of lust of the eyes. So if you love the world and honor the world and desire the world, you're going to have the lust of the flesh, you're going to have the lust of the eyes, but then finally you're going to have the pride of life. That there's a Greek word, uh, alazone, that's the word that's used here, and we get the word arrogance from that word. Uh, when you love the world, it generates arrogance. You, you think, man, I am bulletproof. I am 12 foot tall and bulletproof and nothing can hurt me at all. And you begin to, to boast. Uh, in James chapter 4, uh, you've got that passage where people say it, and I'm sorry I'm not quoting it directly. Uh, James says, you who say to yourselves, tomorrow I'm going to go to this place and do trade, and then I'm going to go to that place and do trade, and I'm just going to plan out my life, and James says, uh, your life is a vapor. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Then he says, you ought to say if it's God's will. I'll go here and go there and do these things. And then in verse 16, he says, all of that is nothing but boasting. Boasting about the future. Man, by the time I'm 30, I'm going to be partner in a law firm. By the time I'm 30, I'm going to be vice president of this bank. By the time I'm 30, I'm going to be head coach of this team. You know, tomorrow may not come, and if it does come, you may not be here to see it. So don't boast about tomorrow. The Bible says if you know, today's got enough problems, don't invite problems tomorrow. We've all known people who've fallen because of pride. Uh, you know, nobody's going to get me. I'm so spiritual, and I've got this bubble around me, and nothing can get to me. You know what the Bible says? Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit uh, before a fall. The Enron Corporation was founded in 1985. It was an oil and gas production company. At its zenith, it had 29,000 employees in 17 different countries. Its revenues were one half trillion dollars a year. Fortune magazine named Enron for seven years in a row the most successful corporation in America and the best run corporation in America. Ken Lay, the CEO and founder, went on Face the Nation and said, we're going to last a thousand years. We got all these reserves and we got this business plan. Nothing is going to topple us. In the year 2000, their stock was selling for about $140 a share. Within 18 months, their, shop, their stock was two cents a share. 15,000 American investors lost everything, including the mother-in-law of President George W. Bush. She had invested hundreds of thousands of dollars and lost every penny of it, all because of that pride. Man, we're immune. We're bulletproof. 
And the next thing you know, Enron is just on the ash heap of great companies that have gone the way of the dinosaur. They even had to change the name of the Houston baseball stadium. It used to be called Enron Field. Now it's called Minute Maid Park. <laughs> because Enron couldn't afford the $2 million a year to, to name it. Five of their exe executives went to prison over the scandal and corruption. That is an example, one of many, I could cite of the pride of life. So John says, don't love the world because of who believers are. We possess the love of God. Don't love the world because of what it brings out in us. The, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the, the pride of life. You're, you're more concerned about what others think than you are what God thinks about you. And then finally, don't love the world because of the uncertainty of life. Verse 17, he says the world is passing away. The, the world is dying all around us. Yes, we're replenishing and, and you know trying to replace what's been torn down and, and sandblasted and all of that, but the world is soon passing away. One day it's going to be destroyed with fire. Uh, 1 Peter 3.10, it's going to just pass away. The elements will be dissolved and there'll be a new heaven and new earth. That's talking about a new universe. There's a new age coming and Jesus is going to return and he's going to establish his earthly kingdom. In other words, he's going to do what people thought he would do 2,000 years ago. Uh, Satan will be bound and we will reign for a thousand years with him. We call that the thousand year millennial reign of Jesus Christ. We are premillennialists. I hope we all are. That just means that we believe Jesus will come back and he will bring his saints with him. He'll set up an earthly kingdom. We'll reign for a thousand years. After that, Satan will be released for a short while. He will go on a tear and do as much damage as he possibly can. But then in Revelation 19, he will finally be wrestled and thrown to the ground and thrown into hell and the gate will be locked and the key will be thrown away. It'll happen like a thief in the night. Uh, Paul addresses this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Look over to, or excuse me, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians 1, beginning to read in verse 6. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled, uh, rest with us, whom the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in the saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Don't fall in love with the world because the world's going to be gone one day. One day soon, I believe, I believe we're in the last days, I really do. Everything you see, the, the Louvre, the Hope Diamond at the Smithsonian, all of the wealth of Wall Street, it's going to be dissolved just like that. The only thing that will survive is those things that are pleasing to Almighty God. You know, Paul talks about people building their lives. And some people build it on wood, hay, and stubble. And, and that's just an analogy talking about people who build their lives on things that really don't matter at all. And we're to build on gold, silver, and precious jewels. And, and Paul says one day... Fire will come and will demonstrate the durability of the lives we'll, we built. And, you know, lives built on wood, hay, and stubble, they'll vanish instantaneously. But lives built on gold, silver, and, and precious jewels shall stand the test of time and will survive together. We're, we're to build selectively. We're to build expectantly. 
knowing that one day we will give an account for the life we have built. Now John concludes in the last part of verse 17. He said, the only thing that really matters is to do the will of God. God's plan and purpose for your life. Now, what is God's will? I may not be able to tell you specifically what God's will is. I'm reminded of the old farmer who went forward one night in a service about like this. He said, I was out in my fields the other day and I saw a cloud formation that spelled out the letters GP. And I believe that that meant go preach. God is calling me to preach and I'm just acknowledging that call. Well, a few weeks later, the preacher invited him to fill the pulpit. He had this dramatic call. Well, he got up there and, and uh, did his best and a couple of deacons went up to him afterwards and said, Sir, I hate to tell you this. I don't believe that GP meant go preach. I believe that GP meant go plow. <laughs> you know, God's got a purpose for you, and you ascertain what that, is, what that is, but generally I can tell you what God's purpose is. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, It is God's will that you be thankful. You be a person of gratitude. 1 Peter 2.15 says, It is God's will that you do good to everyone you encounter. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 said it is God's will that you avoid sexual immorality. 1 Peter 3, 17 says it's God's will that you're going to suffer for doing good. The you know, only two guarantees, if you're a believer, you are guaranteed that you'll have love for fellow believers and you're guaranteed that you will suffer because of your faith. If, if you don't have those things going in your life, you might need to revisit your salvation experience. But the most important thing about God's will, it is God's will that you be saved. Anybody who goes to hell, goes to hell in violation of God's will for their lives. Second Peter, uh, Peter says, God is not willing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to eternal life. First Timothy 2, 4, God desires that all should be saved. In fact, the very last invitation of the Bible. Look at the last verse or two of Revelation 22. You know, the entire book is about our victory in Jesus Christ and, and what's coming in the future. Now, it is written in coded language because Christians were being persecuted. If John had just written and said, well, you know, one day old Domitian, the emperor, he's going to be overturned. You know, that would have aroused the ire, but he wrote in coded language, so, you know, it's a little bit too difficult to interpret, but the overall theme is the victory that's ours in Jesus Christ. And look at verse 17. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come! And let him that heareth say, Come! And let him that is a thirst come! And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. The very last invitation of the Bible. Now yeah, the Bible begins in a garden. Garden of Eden. It ends in a garden. The beautiful picture, you know, paradise is a word that means a, a nobleman's garden. So it begins and ends in the gracious invitation. You come and you participate and you reap all of the benefits out of this garden. Well, I don't know about you. I told you I had to go into my man cave this afternoon. Just kind of press my nose into the carpet, and I do some repenting. Because I tell you, there are times I, I kind of love the world. Yeah, I love possessions, and I love some of the things the world has to, to offer. And, you know, I, maybe it's just me, but I sense that I'm not alone tonight. I think I might uh, have some company. Like I said, that doesn't mean you drive an old hoopty. You know, don't drive a you know 40-year-old car that's on ball tire. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about don't fall so much in love with society that you neglect the things in life that really, really matter. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your spirit. I can sense that you've been moving tonight and help us to repent from our inordinate love of the world. And Lord, there have been churches who fall in love with the world. They, 
They want to look like the world and act like the world and sing like the world and preach like the world. And, and Father, they do it in an effort to be you know, of the world and not in it. And I don't fault that. But, but Lord, I'm also reminded your word says that we ought to be holy as, as, as you're holy. And I pray that our lifestyles and our attitudes and the way we worship would demonstrate true all that we feel for you and your power. So help us to fall in love afresh and anew with you and you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. God bless you. Have a great week.